Hi, this is David Marchese for Salon.com, and today you're going to be listening to me talk to Carly Simon, who you probably know from her hits like Patient and everyone's favorite uh, Put Down slash Who Done It, You're So Vain. I was talking to Carly about her new album, Into White, which features her singing lullabies by folks like the Beatles and Cat Stevens, as well as older songs like Oh Susanna. Um, so listen, enjoy, and wait and see if she tells me who your Sylvain is about. Thanks. Do you think, I mean, obviously, throughout your career, you've, your, your material has, I think it's fair to say, been um, an accurate reflection of how you were feeling at different moments in your life. And this album, seeing it as how it's um, a collection of, of lullabies and songs that could be lullabies, is sort of a more placid album. Does that Does that mean that your life is sort of feeling a little more comfortable or, or placid? No. no, no, that has nothing to do with it. I, I, I can be, I can put myself almost in any musical direction, mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter whether I'm, I'm, uh, you know, whether I'm climbing an ice cap mountain, I could still sing any any of these lullabies, or whether I'm in a rage at, at my husband or whether I'm it, no I could still I, I, I feel emotionally available to all of the sentiments mm-hmm. is, is there any sense though that um, I mean do, don't you look for sort of catharsis through your songs and seeing as how the last two albums haven't necessarily afforded you the opportunity to to vent through songs is that something that's, that's frustrating or do you find other other <clears throat> avenues for for getting those feelings out well I still write the lyrics right and so the fact that they haven't culminated yet into an entire album doesn't mean that they won't. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'll always be able to relive those, those you know, moments. And I'm sure I'll be writing new songs mm-hmm. based, based on how I feel. I mean, there's so, so many vicissitudes of the ways I feel about another human being. In the course of a day, you know, I'll, I'll be very... Because I am an... I'm, I'm a labile person, and so I I, um, I can feel very, you know, I get my feelings hurt incredibly easy, and my whole outlook on my relationship with somebody changes in the course of five minutes, only to change back again in another ten. Right. So, you know, already you've gotten at least five songs out of out of those changes. So if I happen to write them down, I it's it's all. It's always a matter of catching them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I get lazy and I just don't travel around with a pad and pencil or a tape recorder. I mean, Moonlight Serenade did extremely well. And the, so far, the reviews for this album have been pretty good. I mean, what what do you think, and actually some of your contemporaries have, have had success recently with similar albums. I mean, what do you think is going on now that people are responding to, to sort of the classic songbook? Oh, a classic songbook. As in what kind of songbook? I mean, not not lullabies. You're not talking about. Well, I mean, you could you could argue that "Over the Rainbow" is is out of the classic songbook, right? Yeah, but it's. I, I really, mean, I don't I don't want to split hair. Or so, I, sort of, I don't like. For some reason, I'm reacting against a classic songbook as a, a description of this album at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I would call a classic songbook. You know, Moonlight Serenade would be a classic songbook. Right. But not this. So maybe I could... Uh, I mean, so how would you describe them? J- simply lullabies? No. I, uh, I, I would say uh, it's an album of lulling songs mm-hmm. done in a very um, in a very fresh kind of way. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, using the kalimba as, as the only rhythm machine. I mean, you know, is the other is the only rhythm instrument is um, is an unusual thing to do. Just the particular instruments played on this album are because of what was around. It's not a studio produced album. It's an album because somebody had a pipe on their wall that we took down and played. So it's so it's kind of like you know primitives out in the wild, you know scrounging for food and putting a meal together according to what they found. Was it at all um, daunting or, or challenging to sort of take songs that a lot of people would be very familiar with 
and, and sort of find new ways of, of presenting them to your listeners? Is that, is that something that you thought about consciously? No, because I, I feel more as if this album is a sung album as opposed to a performed album. So I'm not trying to be different. I'm just, I'm singing it as pot, as naturally as possible. You know, there's, there are no, um, I'm not striving for, for novelty. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like um, recording the album what ended up being sort of a, a pleasurable and, and creative process. But it seems, I'm just wondering if the idea that the album sort of came out, e- even if it's indirectly as a result of, of, what your your record label was hoping you would do, rather than perhaps what you would do. I mean, how much how much do sort of the business considerations factor into into your thinking at this point in your career? I mean, you've already had you've had a long successful career with tons of hits. Are are you still are you still at all concerned with? I mean, how well an album is going to sell? Um, yes, because I'm building a new edition on my house. <laughs> Very concerned. Mm. I mean, I really hope it sells. Um, it sells well because I've always wanted. I, I've never had a kitchen in my house, which sounds totally retarded. But 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 I've lived in the kitchen that we built when uh, I was first married in 1971, and it was definitely a hippie kitchen. And I've just never enlarged it from that that time. And now I'm finally building myself a kitchen, which is going to spare spare nothing. And so yes, I'm I'm. Uh, I'm interested that this, you know I don't tour, so I don't make the kind of money that that you expect people in rock and roll to make. Mm-hmm. And so I I I need to make my money for my records. It's and so therefore, the, the combination of having such a low budget as, as this album had, if I can sell enough, then I will make some money. Mm-hmm. I I won't be making very much on the publishing since they're not my songs except for one of them which is you're the love of my life mm-hmm. so but those considerations are still still a part of the thinking that that helps you guide what what projects you choose to take on at a given time yes i i you know i i need to kind of live a little bit on the edge you know mm-hmm. in terms of of not uh of always worrying about what i mean and i and i still do you know, sort of watch money really, really carefully, and don't like, you know, don't like to. Oh, I don't like to overspend. Even though last night I spent close to three thousand dollars on a dinner party for my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could have been worse. But is there is there any part of you that um, I just have to say I'm a little taken aback because I find it's just surprising to me that Carly Simon has never lived in a house with a kitchen. It seems like that could have come up at some point, but. Well, you know it. I thought of it sort of as a kitchen, mm. but the trouble is you couldn't walk between the stove and the place that you ate. So, so the people who were eating at the counter, because there was only a counter in the kitchen and no dining room, and so you had to kind of, you know, be very thin and then wedge yourself between the stools that were that were up at at the counter and the and the and the stove. And God forbid if you had to open an oven door, then you had to move everybody. Um, but, but kitchens aside, I know both your both your children are on independent or smaller record labels, and presumably being on smaller record label affords them a certain amount of slack or, or freedom with their with their musical choices that maybe mm-hmm. you, you don't have. Is there is there an attraction to that? Would you, you know? Do you ever are you envious at all, or would you consider sort of scaling back the the size of of your involvement in the music business? To give you to give you added freedom to set those fifty or hundred lyrics to music. Well, you know, I I really like my relationship with uh, Columbia, mm-hmm. and and it would be and and I think they like their relationship with me. So if if it um you know if it goes forward, um if 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 this record you know doesn't lose them money. Or if it, I mean, even if they do a little bit better than breaking even, which I hope they will, you know, considering that it was a very low, uh, low budget. Although they have spent quite a bit on marketing, but we were really lucky, and we got you know, we got Starbucks. Right, the album is being sold in Starbucks stores. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and we did Oprah, which is going to be on January fifteenth. 
and we just did QVC. So those are three major exposing, you know, um, areas of exposure. Mm-hmm. And and now with Salon.com, I think we've got it covered. And do you think, though, that having the album at Starbucks and going on Oprah, are, is doing that sort of publicity a necessity for you at this point, seeing as how, I mean, it's probably unlikely that something from Into White is going to be played much on radio? Oh, that's right. It probably won't be played. It right. won't be played on radio, right. but if it is played on Oprah, that's pretty huge. Mm-hmm. And so that you don't necessarily need radio as a follow-up. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it'll. I mean, hopefully, it'll be downloaded on on the people's iPods and and you know bought it bought at iTunes and and hopefully people will pick it up at Starbucks and hopefully hopefully there will be other avenues over the internet that that are challenging radio at this very, you know, point. I don't think people are listening nearly as much to radio as, or really relying on getting their new music you know, from radio, since radio rarely plays new music. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to, be, to be honest with you, before, um, or in my preparation for the interview and in speaking with the people at your record company, they sort of gave me, and actually in, in reading uh, other um, features and articles about you, there's sort of the sense that... Um, an interview with you could be sort of a prickly proposition. But here, I mean, here we are having a completely nice conversation. And so do you think that sort of maybe the public perception of you or the perception among the media is, I mean, have, do, you, do you feel like it's it's been accurate? That it's prickly in terms of what? Uh, there was just a sense that, you know, there were certain subject matters that I should stay away from, or perhaps you were sensitive about talking about particular subjects. There's nothing that I'm sensitive about talking about. I'm one of the most open people that you'll ever meet. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's true that I, I have been, I, I have I have mononucleosis now and Epstein-Barr syndrome. Yikes. So I'm very, I'm, I'm just kind of tired and, yeah. and, and sick. So, so that may have been, it may be hard to get an interview with her because she's just exhausted. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, I mean, what, who did you talk to there about this? Well, I don't, I don't want to get anybody in trouble or anything, but I no, mean, it wouldn't get them in trouble. I mean, it just shows you that they're kind of protective of me, right? Um, I mean, I was I was told that I probably shouldn't talk about Moonlight Serenade. I'm not sure why. And uh, then I was also told that you were sensitive about um, the idea that perhaps you were in some sense copying somebody like Rod Stewart, even though you had released standard albums, standards albums long before he did. Oh, you mean with Moonlight Serenade? Right. Well, go ahead and ask me. I'll, I mean, I'll tell you, I'm not at all. I love Moonlight Serenade. I'm very proud of it. 